This is the Mark Dolan Way. Top tips for mind, body and soul, some great life hacks and my favourite products of the week. This show is available on all podcast platforms or you can watch it. Just subscribe to the Mark Dolan Way on YouTube and join the Facebook group. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the show. I hope you are very well. It is now October and it's getting a bit cold. I am wearing a jumper for the first time since spring of this year. And I love a woolly jumper. In fact, I think autumn and winter are great seasons because that's when you get out your winter collection, your chunky sweaters, your long trousers, your hiking boots, your waterproofs, the old Gore-Texes, the heavy coats. Oh my God, I love a bit of winter, love a bit of autumn. I know it's not for everyone, but I think it's nice just to have those kind of cosy evenings, you know, the open fire. And um, I've got a radiator, which is in front of the sofa in my living room. So the sofa has no back because this was an antique sofa, which came with a really massive, large back on it. We inherited it. My, uh, it's, it's a family heirloom from my wife's side. So it's this uh, nice old German sofa with a very high sort of arched back to it, which mercifully was removable or detachable and so what we did is we took it off, we removed it. So now all you've got is just the base. You've got the sofa where you sit on it, but no, nothing behind it. And so what I've got now is I've got that and it's up against the radiator, which is really great in the winter because if you're watching TV or you're watching movies, you, you put the radiator on and you, you literally just, you've got your back on the radiator. So it just warms you, it's really toasty. Sometimes the radiator is too hot and you have to have a pillow between you and the radiator, but it's very cozy. And I would argue very environmentally friendly because you have just got this one radiator, which is an isolated heat source. You're not trying to heat up the whole room. It's just very local, isn't it? You know, you are leaning against the radiator. That's a lovely thing. Um, and that's something I'm a big fan of doing in the winter is to isolate radiators. I mean, I know it's bloody obvious, but I'll say it anyway, which is, you know, to go around, and just switch off the radiators that are obviously, obviously, if they're in a room that you're not using very often, they should be switched off. But even if they're in a room where you are often, like our kitchen, you don't really need the radiator because like the oven's on and you're quite active in the kitchen, aren't you? And layers. I'm a great believer in rather than altering the temperature of the room, just alter the amount of clothing you're wearing go very direct with your temperature. But anyway, my great indulgence is having this radiator in a living room on if I'm in there watching stuff. Um, it's kind of the modern equivalent of an open roaring fire. So um, I am, some people like a, a hot water bottle. That's an option, isn't it? I find them quite hazardous. I don't know why I'm just afraid that they're going to explode on me. I don't fancy burns. I lived with a really nice lady who was on a train, I think, and she had a hot tea. You know how rickety and shaky trains can be? She had a hot tea. She spilt it on herself, boiling hot tea, including on her nether regions. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? <sighs> anyway, she, she was okay, but it was pretty traumatic. People and burns, that's crazy, isn't it? I have a, I cohabit with someone that's always burning themselves. Can be guaranteed to like just touch a hot plate or a hot pla or hot, hot hot pan, even though they know it's hot. Uh, my mum is amazing with with burns. Right, she never gets burned. She's just like an asbestos woman. She's Irish, and the Irish are built to drink hot tea. Okay, tea is just that is the. That is the hydration, hydration solution of the Irish people. The Irish people mainline. I don't know if it's still true now, but growing up, my family, both my parents were Irish and they 
on our many wonderful holidays to Ireland, you were offered tea every time you visited a house and it just was just, they were all over that, that, that pot. The pot was always, always being warmed with a tea cosy. Isn't that nice to have a, a teapot with a tea cosy on it? A little sweater just for the pot. How civilized is that? What genius came up with that? I'd love to know, by the way, how effective the tea cosy is. I don't know if there's any engineers listening, but do you think that a woolly jumper preserves the heat of a teapot? I guess so. I mean, I can't imagine it's very thermal efficient, but I guess it's better than nothing. And it looks good too, doesn't it? <laughs> so um, my mum, she, I grew up with her and her tea addiction. And she would make a cup of tea in the morning, right? Boiling water, had to be boiling water straight into the cup with the with the, um, with the the bag. And then bag comes out, tiny amount of milk, like a dot of milk. And then bang, she would just drink it straight away, this boiling hot water coursing through her mouth, right? Just no problem at all. There's no heat sensitivity in her tongue and in her mouth or in her throat or in her gut, or her esophagus, just literally just pouring boiling hot liquid down her throat. But because it had the tea leaves, because it had the caffeine, it wasn't a problem. But honestly, my mum, can, can, she can drink boiling hot tea from, from the get-go. I am a terribly weak person, and I need it to cool down. I have to wait, like a child, I have to wait for it to become uh, a comfortable temperature. I do like it hot, but just not too hot. By the way, that's my top tip for a sore throat. If you've got a sore throat, I've got two great tips for you. Are you ready? For a sore throat, or three really, but anyway, my favorite one, if you've got a sore throat, especially if it feels like it's starting to get infected, is hot drinks. Now, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, yes, lemon with hot water, a little bit of sweetener, no problem. That's a classic, isn't it? Then you've got, in this country, we've got a product called Lemsip, which is paracetamol with a little bit of lemon flavoring and a touch of sugar. But actually, I don't think it really matters what the hot drink is, okay? It can be tea, coffee, any of those things I've mentioned. But there's something about the hot drink landing on your tonsils. It seems to just, I think it brings fresh blood to the area. And also, I think that if there's an infection, it helps to sort of draw the infection out. And I've certainly had, in my time, I've had sore throats where you can see a little bit of yellow. Oh, God, how terrible is that? It's nearly as bad as spilling tea on your genitals, isn't it? Um, (laughs) Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Um, So... Yeah, I've had yellow tonsils. And then what you do is you drink the hot tea. And you make sure, normally I would not recommend, and by the way, please be careful. The advice in this podcast, you must take responsibility for everything you do. Okay, please be careful. And also if you're ill with anything, consult your doctor. I'm not a doctor, but um, I've had that the yellow tonsils. <clears throat> and you drink the hot tea and you make sure that it's sort of uncomfortably hot. It's not gonna, I don't want you to burn yourself. But it's hot enough that when it hits your tonsils, it's going to kind of, um, it's going to, you're going to have this hot water on the tonsils that will help to, will help to open them up, basically. It's kind of a hot shock to your throat. Okay, please don't burn yourself. And kids, do not, no children should do this, only adults. But I have found that, that I've got this all throat and then just a big hot cup of tea, and it's hotter in my mouth than it normally would be. This is a kind of um, therapeutic solution. And I find that then uh, actually the, the pus sometimes leaks out because of this hot water has kind of opened the tonsils a little bit or drawn a fresh blood into the area. Uh, or who knows what it does? Does it kill the bacteria? I don't know what it does, but the hot liquid on your throat is really, really good. And I am a bit of a veteran, a bit of an expert on sore throats because I had them a lot when I was a child. I think it runs in the family because my brother had them and had it was so bad for him that he had to have his tonsils removed. 
He was dogged with sore throats for many years and tonsillitis, you know, no way to live your life. It is one of the worst things, right? Because if you've got a runny nose or other stuff, you, you can kind of like slightly forget about it. But the problem with a sore throat is that every time you swallow, you can feel it. So you're reminded every five seconds that it's there. That's not nice, is it? Um, when my brother had his tonsils out, um, apparently the stink in the operating theatre was really, really strong like a really strong rancid smell when they opened his tonsils. So basically they were just full of disease, full of bacteria and this festering pus, all sort of deep embedded, almost, you know, these, these ruined diseased tonsils. Can you imagine what he went through? They cut them out and apparently it absolutely stank. Yuck. I mean, it's disgusting, but it's also very satisfying, isn't it? Don't you think? Just the idea of it, that you cut the tonsils out and all this yellow pus just leaks away. And you take the rotten, ruined tonsils and you just chuck them in the bin. Chuck them in the bin. Throw them away. Um, I don't know. It satisfies me. I do. I do think in another life, if I'd been any good at science... I would have been tempted to go for medicine and perhaps in particular surgery because surgeons are lucky, really. They are doctors that do get to make a tangible difference to a patient, don't they? It's a really, it's a really um, definitive um, form of medicine. It's an intervention. It's you know, the problem with what a lot of doctors do, you've got symptoms, you get migraines or God knows back pain or this and that. And they give you medication and they recommend exercises and this and that. It's all a bit abstract, isn't it? And it's all a bit of a punt. And they don't have, doctors do their best, but they, they don't have much success with a whole host of symptoms, if we're honest, really. You know what I mean? They never really fix, you know, stuff like back pain um, without without surgery you know it's not the hit rate's not great is it whereas surgeons they get to really you know there's cancer and they just cut you open and they use a sharp knife and they chop it out my dad had a knee replacement and it's amazing because the knee itself was completely gone it was completely worn out you know the cartilage was gone it was bone on bone a lot of pain and a lot of arthritis and I talked to his doctor about it and I said um will he still when he gets the new knee will he still have arthritis and the doctor said no that just it's it's all in the knee so that just gets thrown away so you just if there's arthritis in the knee you remove the whole knee and therefore you're throwing the ruined knee in the bin and with it the arthritis is just being chucked in the bin as well that's got to be satisfying if you're a surgeon and my dad's knee is excellent. I mean, it, it's as good as gold. Another friend of mine has had a knee replacement and he, he's great. He's flying around playing tennis and all the rest of it. Apparently they have a, a sort of shelf life of 10 to 15 years. But if you look after them, I, I think they last longer because my dad had his up about 20 years ago and he's fine. I think what you don't do is marathon running. But I mean, I think it's amazing. It's amazing, isn't it? That they can just replace limbs now. Isn't that tremendous? My grandfather lost both of his legs. Um, I don't mean he mislaid them. That would be foolhardy in the extreme, wouldn't it? He lost them um, very sadly. He lost one. They took one off because he had uh, an infection in his foot like gangrene. That's not great, is it? And then it happened to the other one. So he lost both legs and fair play to him. You know, he was an old man in his late 70s, early 80s when this happened. And they gave him these prosthetic legs. And he learnt to walk on one of them because the other leg was still good. And then when the other leg went, then he learnt to walk on two prosthetic limbs. That's not bad for a man so old, so late in life, is it? And he learnt to kind of, they were very basic prosthetic legs. They're much better these days, I'm sure. But you kind of would press these two buttons on the side and it would unlock the legs so it folded. So like you could click it so it would be sort of straight and then you could unclick it so it would bend. Very mechanical, but, you know, not bad. And what he had is his, his legs, they took his legs off from above the knee. 
So they just had, I mean, it's a terrible word, I know, but I can't think of a better word to describe it. He just had two stumps. Um, and also, it's amazing how they, uh, he, how they, how would you do that, right? You know, you like cut the leg off. They managed to like stitch the skin at the bottom of the stump nicely together so that within a few weeks, you know, it's just like this nice, smooth leg, the stump. It was very impressive. And it's very, very skilled, isn't it? But if you're a surgeon, that's got to be satisfying. You know, there's a basically a kind of ruined foot. You've got this diseased gangrene foot. And you just chop it off. I mean, it's, you know what I mean? It's, there's got to be an instant reward, a degree of gratification for the surgeon. You know, removing diseased tonsils, removing worn out knees. It's like being a garage mechanic or something, isn't it? And sort of just dropping a new carburetor into a Toyota Prius and you're good to go. It's marvellous. It's marvellous what they do, surgeons. And so I think maybe, yeah, if I, in another life, I think I would be a surgeon because, you know, you get home and you, your partner or your kids say to you, what do you do today, dad? And you can say, well, I unblocked an artery in this guy's heart. I took, I took a vein from his, from his calf muscle and I, I wired it into his heart. I just located it. I just created a new vein in his heart. And I stitched it all together. And now the blood is flowing nicely. I mean, that's just great, isn't it? Um, but back to... Back to... You know, that reminds me of an Elton John lyric. Back to the howling old owl in the wood. Do you know what that is? That is a lyric from Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. And it demonstrates... What an amazing songwriter Elton John is, because how the hell, how the hell can you wrap a melody around that lyric? Back to the howling old owl in the wood. No disrespect to Torpin, his lyricist, who is my hero, but that's a very clunky lyric, isn't it? Back to the howling old owl in the wood. How do you wrap a melody around that? Well, Elton does it. Back to the howling old owl in the wood. Hunting the horny bag toad. Oh, I finally decided my future lies beyond the yellow brick road. Are you allowed to sing on podcasts? Do I have to give Elton and Bernie some money now? But anyway, um, let us have a look at this. So, yeah, I wanted to say that um, my... Um, sore throats. So the hot tea is really good. If you're going to take a medication, I'm not a doctor, but this is my experience. I think ibuprofen is good. I think the Americans call it Tylenol. And the reason why, uh, or, or aspirin, is because these are in the anti-inflammatory family of drugs. Bring inflammation down. There are two schools of thought. Some doctors think you should keep the inflammation because that's the healing process, but others think you should bring the inflammation down. Um, but it's certainly from a point of view of the pain, um, a uh, an ibuprofen and urofen will uh, potentially help. Um, what I tend to do when I've got pain like that is that if I'm just, let's say it's a day off and I haven't got any responsibilities, I've got nothing to do, I will just accept the pain because it doesn't matter. It's my day off. I can just be in pain. But let's say I'm working and I need to be really productive, or let's say I can't sleep. Then I think pain management is good then, because pain management, you know, at night, if anything is keeping you awake, that's going to hinder the healing process for sure. So therefore, I have certainly taken painkillers at night just to get the sleep, and then bang, you feel better the next day. I've never taken sleeping pills, by the way. And I hope never to. But I understand many people sh struggle with insomnia and they need something. And I fully understand that. That would be the Holy Grail. There are a few Holy Grail medications out there, aren't there, that would just, if they could come up with a healthy cure for insomnia, a pill, you just get eight or nine hours of really high quality sleep. Can you imagine the value of that medication? It would be the most popular medication on earth it would be twice as popular as statins the problem you've got with current sleeping pills is that you do sleep but you don't get that deep restorative sleep you don't get the rem you're not refreshed the next day so you've had the sleep 
it's better than nothing, but not, not to, I, the, you, you, there is a product in this country called Night Nurse and, you know, good luck to them. It's, it's very helpful to many people. So no problem. Um, I think it's a mixture of paracetamol and there's a little bit of uh, something in there to help you sleep. And so I don't wish to be, you know, I wouldn't put you off each to their own. But I found as a child, my mum used to give me that. And you do sleep, but you're groggy the next day, which for me defeats the object. Um, so, yeah, that's the option. That's your pain management for it. You've got your hot tea. There is another thing you can do, but I honestly, I'm not recommending this. I'm just going to say that I have done it once or twice. I would actually say don't do this. There you go. Don't do this. Um, but if you see the yellow stuff in the back of your throat, you can put your finger in and pop it. I've done that. I have popped the infection in the tonsil with my finger, but I think it's a really bad idea. I'm just putting on record, do not do it. And your doctor will say don't do it, but I have, I have done it. And I have popped it. And I've got, unfortunately, did mention this to um, the girlfriend of a friend of mine. And uh, she was away. And she was traveling with my friend. And it was like a few days into their trip. They were both exhausted. She got tonsillitis, which is always what happens when you're exhausted and your immune system is low. And she was in real pain. And then she, um, I spoke to her a day or two after that and she's like oh I popped it and that when then it was fine after that so she did pop it but don't do it I think it's a really bad idea but I'm just putting it out there that that's what I've done and occasionally that but um there you go so there you go you pop it by the way uh, that's my other big thing you know I find the idea of being a surgeon very satisfying <clears throat> I also I'm squeezing spots and blackheads I could do that all day long have you seen that brilliant website and the social media phenomenon of the pimple popper and it's a lady that she basically she's like a doctor type she may be a doctor she probably is and she 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 squeezes spots for a living is that not the best job in the world to squeeze spots and then just how many times a day she gets to watch that you know she squeezes it and then the yellow just like pops out it just explodes oh my god Am I the only one that just really enjoys what you know, squeezing my own spots, squeezing other people's spots? If I was a billionaire, I might actually sort of pay spotty teenagers to just let me squeeze their spots. You know, it'd be fully consensual. They'd get good money. You know, they, they can use that money towards their, uh, you know, university tuition fees, whatever it is. But I'll just say, look, can you, you, you know, Sammy age, let's say this young lad, 16, he comes round all spotty and I just get to squeeze his, squeeze his spots for the afternoon. Um, <laughs> what's really satisfying when you squeeze a spot, right? Is you squeeze a spot, you get the yellow out. And then you've got to squeeze it more because then have you ever had the double pop where you squeeze a spot and it pops and then you squeeze it again and there's like a kind of inner, more internal pop. There's another bit and that pops like a secondary pop. And then normally what happens then is you get the blood. And I think that's the key thing is you need the follow through of the blood because then, you know, you've cleared it. I did have acne as a child. Awful, awful stuff. I think I've talked about it in a previous podcast. I, I got a girlfriend and then like three days later, I got acne. <laughs> How bad luck is that? And so. Yeah, so. um I was distracted by that. I should have had it on silent. Can I apologize? Should we see? Should we see what that is? Uh, okay. Lovely. Uh, now, let me just make sure that everything is still running. Can't have any technical issues here. Right. The, um, how did I get onto the popping? Oh yeah. So, okay. The hot, the hot water the medication the other thing you can do with an infection like a sort of sore throat is you can use antiseptic mouthwash and all you do is you gargle with it a lot of people recommend gargling with salt water which i think is definitely worth doing um, but i i sometimes will use one of those really professional sort of dental mouthwashes which are antiseptic 
And I find they're really good too. And there's a very good one in the UK called Corsadil. It's hardcore. And it's gargled with that for ages. And make sure that the Corsadil is just like actually making contact with your tonsils. Gargle, gargle, gargle. Make sure and spit. But you can just do that till the cows come home. And I think that's helpful. So that's my wide ranging recommendation for the sore throat. But can I tell you my other big obsession? And I have mentioned it before, but I cannot tell you too often because it's so effective. And everyone, the doctors listening will be pleased to hear that because they'll be horrified about my anecdotes of popping my own throat. Now, the reason why you shouldn't do that, by the way, the reason why you must not do that is because you could choke. But you don't put an object in there. You'll swallow that or choke on it. You could choke on your own finger and it could also cause you to vomit. So I've told you that I've done it, but please don't do it. Um, one thing that the doctors will like me recommending. You know I'm all about prevention, right? Prevention is the key thing for all healthcare. Western health systems are threatened with bankruptcy because of preventable illnesses like type 2 diabetes and obesity and smoking and heavy drinking. And it's amazing. I mean, can you imagine if we didn't have smoking, people smoke less or not, not at all. Drinking was moderate and we just ate real food. The, the budget, the cost of, uh, let's say, the National Health Service in the UK would drop by 70 percent. Seriously, seriously, it would just be because how many illnesses are related to obesity, type 2 diabetes, smoking? Uh, smoking is a lung cancer and it furs up your arteries. The obesity is not just the high blood pressure, but it's the incredible wear and tear on your joints if you're overweight. So there are now people aged 30 and 35 getting new knees because their knees have worn out because they're carrying such a volume on their body. So I'm a great believer in prevention. And as you know, we, we go back to what I've advised in the past, which is low carb. Um, what you do is you reduce the amount of carbohydrate in your diet. It's very simple. Carbohydrates, things like rice, pasta, potatoes, bread, sugar, beer, they spike insulin. Insulin is the main fat storage hormone in your body. So when insulin is raised, you store fat. Okay, so let's say you eat some bread, the blood sugar goes up, insulin comes and it turns that sugar, that glucose into fat cells, pushes it into fat cells. And that's how weight gain happens. When insulin is low all day long, the fat cells open and you burn that body fat that you got gets burned for energy and you lose weight. It's really simple. And that is low carb. So I love it. And I lost three stone with it. And I've never looked back. Um, so yeah, that's how that's how you fix it, by the way. Mark, the Mark Dolan Way podcast is all about tangible solutions, right? So you know how I said I'd like to be a surgeon because it's very direct and you just, you know, chop out the diseased kidney or something. Well, what we're doing here is intellectual surgery. I am an intellectual surgeon. And I've got fixes, which are mental intellectual fixes, which absolutely deliver, right? Things like do bad work. If you're procrastinating, remember those three words, do bad work. And if you accept that you're just going to do it badly, you're more likely to get on with it. And then once you've done it, it probably isn't that bad because it's never as bad as you think it is. But the lack of expectation to do it well is what will get you started. Do something average today, not something great tomorrow. And the other great one is um, give it three seconds. If you're struggling, if you're not, if you can't get started with something, just give it three seconds. So you'll find out that sounds ridiculous, but it will just, it is just, it is getting started is the biggest thing. And that's the hack for it. So I am an intellectual surgeon on your behalf, uh, which is going to take me to my next fabulous intervention for sore throats. And this is prevention. And it is quite simply covering your neck. Did you get that? Let me repeat it for you. Three words, a three word cure for sore throats, covering your neck. Because it's amazing how the, the neck is the location of 
a lot of, the neck is like the gateway to your body. The tonsils are in there. They're like the sort of the Thames barrier for um, bacteria. So they are there for a reason. It's interesting with back, with uh, tonsils because about every 10, 15 years, doctors change their mind. So they go through a phase of cutting out the tonsils and then they change their mind. They go, no, they're out there for a reason. And then they say, no, they, they don't do anything. Then they do. And so uh, the problem is it's hard to remove tonsils from adults because it's a risk. Because when you remove tonsils from an adult, the bleeding can be very bad and it can be, it can be quite hazardous. And quite hard to stop the bleeding, whereas I think it's easier in children. But um, unless I'm mistaken, I think that they are much more reluctant to remove tonsils these days. By the way, you can have antibiotics for tonsils, of course. I mean, that's the ultimate. When it's serious, that's what you need to do. I think I feel like at that point, not much else works. But um, prevention is everything. And if you cover your neck and I was in. Inner Mongolia which is near China. It was minus 16 outside when I was there, which is colder than my freezer. And everybody there, they all have the neck covered. And I think that tells you everything you need to know about how not to get ill. Go to cold places. What are they wearing? What do they do? They're all wearing these like a roll neck jumper or scarves or these uh, things that I'm a big fan of but I never really know what they're called. Like, you know, like a neck tube, you know, this is basically just a, it's like a scarf, but it's just a circle and you pull it over your head. What do you call that? What the hell? Oh, is it? It's not a smock. There's a name for it. What is it? And I'm sure you're shouting it at me now. Snood. I think it's a snood. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's a snood. Big fan of those. If you watch now footballers, if you watch them training in the winter, they've got gloves and they've got the snood. It's just around your neck. And you can get all different types. You can get really thick, chunky ones. They can be made from wool, polyester. You don't need a really chunky one. You just need that neck covered. Um, I actually, I was skiing last year and the ski um, ski lift where, where, where I was skiing, they gave you a free snood with your ski pass. And this is like a really thin sort of just, I think it's cotton or polyester, but really fine material, very tight. It just, it just goes on, you just pull it over your head and it just holds onto your neck. Absolutely brilliant. I'm a huge believer in ever since I started covering my neck, I have not had a sore throat or tonsillitis. But I can tell you that before I learned this simple solution, I would get a sore throat once or twice a, a season, you know, once or twice every autumn, winter, I, or even spring, I'd get the sore throat. Um, I cover the neck. I swear by it. I'm obsessed with it. And so the minute the, the temperature changes in any way, I slam a scarf on or I've got a jacket which zips up to my neck and it's just brilliant. It works so well. And I've got a ridiculous collection of snoods now. I think actually when we eventually do merchandising on this show, which if we're honest, it's just a matter of time, isn't it? I mean, you would buy a mug that says do bad work, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you do that? Of course you would. Very good value. Be a great value mug, I promise you. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I, the minute that it's cold, I, I cover myself and I've not had to look back. And I'm, I'm delighted by how effective it is. It's so nice to have these simple solutions that actually work, isn't it? Um. But I know one thing that with a lot of sore throats, this happened to my son last summer, or maybe it was a couple of summers ago, actually. Maybe it was Easter. No, I think it was the summer. And he'd had a busy day. He was on holiday and he had a busy day and he was running around. It was quite hot. And then he sort of finished what he was doing and he swam in the sea and then he walked back. And the walk back to where he was staying involves going through these tunnels, right? It used to be a railway tunnel but now it's just pedestrianised. But the tunnels are long and dark and damp. And so even though it's the summer, when you walk through the tunnels, they're actually kind of quite cold. So he'd been sort of running around and he, he was sort of hot and a bit sweaty. He goes, he then walks home into the tunnels. And I think he was, um, yeah, just in a t-shirt and shorts. And the next day, raging sore throat, even though it's the summer. 
And it's my view, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a professional, but it's my view that he he was hot and then he got cold and he caught a chill and his neck was exposed and he had the sore throat. And in fact, the sore throat was so bad that the poor lad had a bucket next to him in the bed and he would spit rather than swallow because it was too painful to swallow. Now, can I give you a couple of um, other bits and pieces? Um, any other? I mean, I suppose now that we're kind of discussing the winter stuff, what else is there to say? Well, it's time for me to bring back some of my greatest hits. So, for example, don't forget about my rule that as we go into winter. By the way, I have viewers and listeners in Australia and New Zealand. So this advice is unhelpful because it's about to warm up for you. But for many people listening, it's going to get cold. Um, don't forget my rule about the double puffer. Do you remember that? So good. Two puffer jackets. I just cannot. It's my favorite story. It's a terrible story, but I still love it. I bought a puffer jacket online because it was on sale. It was a down puffer jacket. It was a good one and it was crazy reduction. So I bought it. It was too small. So I thought, all right, well, I'll get, I'll get the next one. I'll get the next size out. I'll get the bigger one. And then if that's not right, I'll send both of them back. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm not going to send one back and then the next one back. I'll, I'll do it in a batch. Do you know what I mean? So I've got one. I'm going to get another one delivered. And then if neither are right, it can be one trip to the post office. I think you'll agree that's sensible. So I got the next one. And then the next one was the perfect size. It was great, great, great. So I must now send back the smaller one. No problem. Unworn, with the labels on. Happy days. It was a very cold day don't know what was going on it was freezing out there and I had to I had to pop out and it was really cold so I had both puffer jackets and I thought it's really cold I'm actually going to quickly put both of them on and then I'm going to go out and do whatever it is I had to do so I put the one which is too small on and then I put the one which was the right size on top and of course I think it was like one was a medium one was a large so I got a medium underneath and then a large on top identical color both on sale and I went off in this very cold day and I cannot tell you how good I felt. I was like almost hot. Do you know what I mean? Toasty with this double layer of puffer. Not just that. I happen to think it looked really good because I think layers are just sort of stylish. I think layers just look good. I think when, when people wear like they've got a, a jacket and another jacket underneath, sometimes a different color is quite nice. That contrast. I think it just looks good. Well, I'm wearing this double puffer. And I think actually it's the same color kind of looks good too, because it's still layered. It's just nice. It's just got a, there's substance to it. Do you know what I mean? It's got a nice texture. It's, it's a blue puffer jacket, another blue one on top. You can see it's two jackets. I don't know. Is that just me to have two jackets? Glycosytic, which means at the same time, I'm a fan. I cannot tell you, I can't tell you how good it felt. I was so comfortable. I was so warm, just in this glow. To the point where I feel like I go to outer Mongolia. Or was it inner? It was inner, wasn't it? I can go to inner Mongolia. Sounds like I'm making it up. It, it isn't. It was for a documentary. You can actually, it's on YouTube somewhere. Um, I went to meet the smallest man in the world, a guy called He, he Ping Ping, who sadly is no longer alive. And bless him, but he was a great guy. But that was it. So I then removed the labels and I kept both. And every winter now, I enjoy the luxury of the hashtag double puffer. Absolutely beautiful. I have mentioned this in the past. I make no apologies for giving you this story again because we're going into that season. You don't need to have identical jackets. You don't need to go for that medium and then large solution. I just think you probably have a couple of puffer jackets do you in your collection try wearing them together it's really good if you've got a puffer jacket and it's not quite warm enough purchase another one and combine them and i think you'll find it's ridiculous uh, the other thing you can do is a slight compromise it's not quite as pure but it does work too is you can go for the puffer as your base layer and then you can have another thing on top so i've actually got a bought it in a charity shop i've got a barber jacket which is like a quilted jacket so it's a bit like a puffer jacket it's not down it's polyester but it, it's a kind of it, it is a it is a um, barber jacket sort of quilted thing puffy you know 
And so I have that. And then I've got a sort of black, smart sort of raincoat type coat jacket on top. You know, like a smart, you know, imagine if you were a guy was going to the office in a suit with a kind of crisp sort of, what would you call that? Like a Mac, like a, a smart business coat thing. So it works really well. You've got the, 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 the puffiness of the barber and then the sort of crisp, smart coat on top. And again, you've got these different colors and there's a different layering and it works really well. So the puffer is a good base layer. And of course, what you can do for the winter as well, I really recommend this actually, is a puffer and then a shell on top. So let's imagine you've got like your Gore-Tex cut type jacket, you've got your waterproof jacket and you wear a puffer under that, then you get the insulation from the puffer and then the shell blocks the wind. You will not get cold. But I'm very enthusiastic. If I actually had unlimited funds, I believe that I would have a collection of puffer jackets, probably 15 or 20 puffer jackets, I think, in my collection. Um, but I'm glad I don't because that would be wasteful. So it's kind of lucky that, that I don't have the means to do that. I was thinking about David Beckham today, who I admire. Uh, I think he's a remarkable guy, really. A great philanthropist and also an ambassador for this country. And he was a really good footballer. You know that his free kicks, he was really good at free kicks. Probably the best in the world at free kicks. And the reason why, I mean, he had a certain talent, but the reason mainly why is that he just practiced free kicks a lot. And the others didn't practice as much. And he was famous for finishing training and all the other players would have lunch, then they'd go home and do com computer games and stuff. And gambling, that's what they like, isn't it? In the old days, the footballers used to go to the pub. I think it was at Arsenal and um, Tony Adams and Ray Parler used to have a thing. Was it the, the Tuesday club or the Monday club? And that just involved heavy drinking and that was that was their club those were the days football's not like that anymore but um Beckham they'd all train in the morning and then they'd go home at lunchtime and Beckham after lunch would pick up the ball and spend the afternoon just whacking a ball into the into the goal hundreds of times thousands of times relentless tedious but that's what made him good so it wasn't just some gift that landed in his pocket I mean yes there was the talent but he built upon that, which is actually one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today, which is that hard work is a free skill. OK, there's a lot of skills we don't have, right? But you may or may not have, you know, we don't have the, the skill to play the piano unless you've learned it. We don't have the skill um, of a language or something. We don't have the skill of a plumber without actually learning these things. So that, you know, and that takes years and you've got to go on a course and all of that. And by the way, I'm a great believer in skilling up. In fact, that's a, a good future discussion for the show. It's about boost your skill set, learn new things. Oh, I must write that down. I've done that. Learn new things. But um, hard work, you don't have to go to go on a course for that. You don't have to attend a lecture. Um, you don't need input from anyone. You can activate that straight away. I would estimate that 95% of people uh, don't work as hard as they could. They work, by the way, to be fair to them, they work hard enough. 5% of people work harder than they have to. And I guarantee you that most of those people are successful. So hard work is a free skill. Isn't that amazing? You just, you, that's it. You can, I can now, can I just say that I'm going to bestow upon you that skill because you might not think you have it, but you absolutely have it. It's, it's like, have you got eyes in your head? Have you got cells in your blood? Yes, you do. Those are just, they ship with the hardware, don't they? You have those things. Well, you have the skill of hard work. So after this show, why do you, why do you not, just flick that switch and work hard. And I promise you two things will happen. 
Uh, well, several things. Three, maybe. Uh, you'll get a lot. You, you get a lot of respect at work. God, did you notice Steve came in 10 minutes early and he got everything done and he did more things. And Steve's a lot more hardworking, a lot more productive and industrious than Caroline, isn't he? You know, we're having to like rationalize how, how much staffing this company has. Who are we, we going to keep, Steve or Caroline? We're going to be Steve. He works harder. Um, I've talked about football fans, right? Football fans will forgive mistakes and they'll forgive losing. But if they see a player on the pitch working harder, giving their all, the fans will will forgive anything if they see you putting a shift in. Well, I guarantee you, your boss will feel the same. Working hard. It's amazing. It's a free skill. 5% of people do it. They are the successful ones. But here's the other kicker. Wait for it. Uh, your, your work will improve. Your financial outcomes are bound to improve. Maybe not straight away, but they will because every you know you become very employable if you're a hard worker. Someone will come in for you. Your, your CV is going to improve. It's just a working hard is a virtuous circle. It's human nature not to work hard. The reason why is because nature does not want to waste energy, right? Nature actually programs you to be as lazy as possible and to do the bare minimum because nature doesn't know whether there's going to be an earthquake or a famine or a drought or a forest fire. So nature is really encouraging you to be lazy and do the minimum amount. So let's say you're in the wild and just just enough energy to kill catch and kill that rabbit and then you eat the rabbit and then you know you can sort of sleep and chill out and all of that and you only look for the next rabbit when you're um really hungry again which could be ages so actually the body that the nature laziness is built into into us you don't see cats out and about you know they they don't do unnecessary work they're sleeping most of the time and then bang, it's time to catch a mouse. Um, so it's in our nature too to do the bare minimum. And you can work against that. And you can hack that because a lot of this show is about hacking who we are and what we were born with and working against it. Do you know what I mean? So my low carb thing, that's a dietary hack. That's a way of hacking the mechanism of insulin to lose weight. Because you could even argue that the body is slightly programmed to gain weight, again, as a survival thing. It's just that now we've got so many donuts and cans of Coke that it's easier to store fat than ever. But, you know, fat fat storage, it is another survival mechanism. It's just been perverted by the modern, the modern diet. But so we're going to work against that. We work against the insulin model for the body. We're going to work against the natural laziness that everyone has. And you're going to be in the 5%. Um, it will also win you friends and it will improve your personal relationships. So, for example, and of course, you know, I can be lazy. Of course I can. But I must say, I will be honest with you, the last few years, I have become much more applied, much more hardworking. I don't know why. I've become very busy. I've liked being busy. There's been momentum with it. And it's just sort of introduced a new mentality and new habits, which are about effort. I, I'm definitely, I've embraced, I am I, what could only be described now, I think, as a hardworking person. A proof of that is that when I finish work, I'm so tired, I can't leave the office. I think that's proof of hard work, isn't it? I just sort of sit there. And by the way, I love it because I chat to my colleagues who are just sensational. So it's very joyful. But it's also because I'm tired, can't move. And I like that. Leave everything on the pitch. You should be tired at the end of a long day. Your head hits the pillow. <coughs> You are out like a light. But there's another thing. Um, oh, yeah. So that was it. So last night I did a thing which was not lazy, but it was it was more. Um, yeah, it was. I'm not going to call it hard work, but it was not lazy, which is I got home. You're going to laugh at this, right? Because this is a man who like did something in the kitchen and he wants everyone to say well done, which is the male disease. But I will tell you that I was so tired when I got back. I was just I just want to crash go to bed I noticed that the kitchen was a bit of a mess and the dishwasher was ready to be emptied now that is that's a good 20 minutes maybe half an hour at the end of my very long day and, like, Ugh. 
And, but I thought to myself, I wasn't working today. Today is what, what they call my day off. So I can have a, I can sleep long. And it means that when my lovely wife goes into the kitchen in the morning, there's a pristine kitchen, sparkling, dishwasher emptied, everything put away. It's a nice thing to come down to. And by the way, this is not male, female thing, because so often uh, she does that. So, you know, I, uh, we try to go 50-50. It doesn't always play out like that. But we pretty much, I think, you know how we arrange it? We arrange it based on how busy everyone is. So when she's really busy, I'm like, I'm on it. On it, on it, on it. She's very kind in that if I'm really busy, she is on it, on it, on it. So we we share the duties, basically. But I could easily have gotten away with, you know, it's not unreasonable, is it, at the end of a long day just to come home and go to bed. But I decided that I will empty that dishwasher and I will do that kitchen. I tried to make a positive, by the way. Do you remember when I've said in the past that if you've got like an annoying job to do, make it fun? So I slammed an interview on. And it was actually, um, it was funnily enough, I don't know why Bernie Taupin is in my mind, but he's got a new book out called Scattershot. And I'll be, I've started reading it. It's very good. Uh, he's the lyricist of Elton John. So he wrote the words, Elton wrote the music. And he, uh, there was a, he's got his book out, his his podcast. He, he, he was interviewed on the radio and it was kind of, it was uploaded as a podcast. So I thought, there you go. It was a half an hour long. I will listen to that whilst doing these rather boring tasks. So that was beautiful, right? So I've emptied the dishwasher, clean, cleaned up the kitchen. And then I've listened to Bernie Taupin, who's a very talented guy and I feel like a great human being. And so I've had input in my head. It's also been kind of relaxing because, you know, you, you know, you get home and you're not thinking about work now. Just listening to this guy talking about his career. Um, there was a great, there's a great little anecdote. It's not really an anecdote, but it's just a great uh, moment. And it was when he wrote, Elton John and he were living at Elton's mother's house because they were both broke, struggling young artists. Bernie had come down from Lincolnshire. They'd been introduced by a record, record company boss because Elton couldn't write words and Bernie didn't write music. And they got together and were like, well, why didn't you guys work together? Because it seems like you've got a different skill set. It was very good. And... Um, so they met up and they became friends and they started writing together. And at first it was like a long distance thing and Bernie would send the lyrics by post. But eventually, as they had started to have like a little bit of interest from a record company, not success, but interest, they, Bernie became like a lodger in Elton's house. I think they might have been in the same room. How adorable is that? How sweet is that? The two of them in a little bunk together. Probably separate bunks, but, you know, I think they might have been in one room. Who knows? Anyway, they became a little writing production line, little factory, the two of them, where old Bernie would scribble out the lyrics in one room and Elton, Reg at the time, would then grab the little manuscript, grab this uh, list of, he'd, he'd have maybe a pile of lyrics. And if he if he liked the look of a title, like I'm still standing, like, yeah, catch his eye. And then he sits down and he reads the words. And the minute he starts reading the words, he gets a little movie in his head, a little sort of motion picture plays out in his mind. And then the fingers go on the keyboards and a song comes out. It is quite miraculous, don't you think? It is miraculous. So uh, your song was obviously the, that was the first really game-changing song that they wrote. And when um, Bernie, so the Bernie is just in his, in Elton's mother's kitchen having breakfast. He writes your song. It's a little bit funny, this feeling inside, you know that lyric. And he writes it on a little piece of paper and then brings it into Elton. I mean, he's just had his breakfast, right? And he brings it into Elton and Elton picks up the lyric. He holds this piece of paper with the words of your song on it, right? Which were going to be, this is the, the golden ticket to superstardom. So he's holding this lyric, this sheet, this piece of paper. And all Elton said was, this has got egg on it. It's a great line, isn't it? This has got egg on it. 
I just love the mundanity of that. This document, I mean, if that went up for auction, you know, the handwritten original lyrics of your song, what is the financial value of that? It's got to be a million pounds, hasn't it? Wouldn't you say? Because it's not just it's not just an Elton hit. It's the first hit and written by a young lad who didn't know whether they'd ever make it. You know, you could get the lyrics to I guess that's why they call it the blues. But that was after all the success. You know, the innocence is gone. But the first really important lyric that they ever wrote. <laughs> imagine imagine J.K. Rowling's first set of notes about Harry Potter. Just imagine the value of that. Or the Beatles, Love Me Do. Anyway, just Elton gets gets the lyrics and says, this has got egg on it. I just love that. It's a very For me, it's a very British story. It's very mundane. It's very suburban. It's a bit gloomy. <laughs> now, there was a point to this. Yeah, so I, I listened to this uh, podcast last night. And I got the dishwasher emptied and I got the place sparkling. And it was so satisfying to know that. And I'd made a little bit of effort at the end of a long day. And I can't think that that would hurt your relationship because then your partner comes down the next day and it's you've not said that you were going to do it. You've not been told or asked to do it or anything. But she just comes down and then bang, everything's lovely. That's got to be good for your relationship. And... It's a big thing in life, you know, whether it's your friends, whether it's a colleague, whether it's your boss, whether it's your partner, going the extra mile, doing little things that you don't have to. My mum, bless her, she worked very hard when I was growing up. She was running the pub with my dad and she's got four kids. It was really full on. She's like doing the food for all the customers and everything. And running a home, running a home, it's, it's, it's you know, it's almost a 24-7 business, really, a pub. It's definitely seven days a week and it's 14 hours a day, I would say, sometimes 16 hours a day. Can you believe it? And uh, my mum used to say, I wish somebody would surprise me once and just, you know, vacuum the living room or um, tidy up the kitchen. She just said that. I remember her saying that when she didn't, wasn't aimed at me. I was quite small when she said that. So it probably wouldn't have been my job. You know, I could have been. 10 years old when that happened, but she just used to say, I wish someone would occasionally surprise me. Isn't that interesting? What a cry for help that was. So why don't you surprise a colleague, surprise a friend, surprise your partner? And that's to do with being in the 5% and just not being lazy. Have you ever lived with a lazy person? Is there anything worse? They leave stuff lying around and it just stays there for days. Horrific. Flatmates where the washing up just piles up and you're the only one that does it lazy people are actually dreadful they are parasitic they're negative and they're not a good thing they're not a good presence but do you know what's miraculous you might be listening to this now and you could be a lazy person you could be a lazy person i've been a lazy person and you can change it straight away now literally now i'm just going to do a click and then it's over there you go. I've broken the spell. You're not lazy anymore. It is a free skill to work hard and it can be activated straight away. And all it is, is a decision. Ricky Gervais is a good example. Marvellous artist that he is. And I'm friendly with his TV producer. We've lost touch in recent years, but a very talented and clever guy, his producer. Ricky Gervais had his own show and I think it was called Meet Ricky Gervais, like a talk show. It was before he really made it. I think um, that was just before The Office came out. And even though Ricky Gervais was so lazy that even though it was a TV show that had his name in the title, he didn't work very hard on it. And my friend was furious because like Ricky's so talented, he's so funny. But for example, he wouldn't, I don't think he would uh, agree to what start work until like 11 a.m. or something. That was a deal breaker for him. He's like a late start. And then by four, he was out of the office and my friend would say, why are you, why are you going home? He's like, oh, I, I like to be, you know, I like to get home late afternoon, have a beer, get the wine open, get into my pyjamas and watch TV. <laughs> um, and, you know, good luck to him. He's such a free spirit. 
Gervais. And but at that time, I do remember my my friend sort of affectionately complaining about about his work ethic. But then what happened is that the office became a big success, and then Ricky gets all these opportunities. I'm just checking the time because I have been told that when these videos are over an hour, it's a problem. I've got 40 seconds. Um, well, what he did is he suddenly started working really hard uh, because of the opportunities. And now he's a workaholic and he's the most famous, successful comedian in the world. Um, I've got to wrap this up because otherwise I'll get in trouble. It's got to be less than an hour. See you next time. Big love. <laughs>